I'm going to call this meeting of the uh, York County Council to order. It's a workshop uh, to discuss our budget. Mr. Hudson, what is, what is first up? We have uh, Billy Dunlap with the Convention of Visitors Bureau. I think he is. Uh, Mr. Dunlap, are you online? Yes. Got to unmute Billy. There you go. Yes, I'm here. And Billy, we've all gotten your, at least I got your presentation that you emailed to us. So you can just crank up whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, I had put together that PowerPoint presentation um, and found out about 20 minutes ago that we couldn't make it work. Uh, so I'm just going to basically go through it just like I would if I was standing there in front of you. Uh, first off, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, and as always, I, I thank you for your service to York County. Uh, what I wanted to do tonight is kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what we've done the past year, what we've got planned for this current year, and kind of walk through the budget uh, a little bit at a time. Uh, as, as you know, our mission is to create a thriving travel and tourism economy in York County. Uh, we do that four different ways, uh, group tours, meetings and conventions, sports tourism, and leisure travel. Uh, when we're talking about the ordinance that created the CBB, uh, it basically gives us a broad brush to, um, to bring tourism to all of York County. Um, so that is what we try to try our best to do every day. Now, looking back at 2019, 2020, we had several uh, strategic initiatives. Uh, one is the Yoko Taste Trail, which um, for about three months was really great. Uh, then we uh, ran into the coronavirus and that slowed that down a little bit. Um, we've also gr grown our destination marketing fee program. Uh, we launched the Battle of the Rock Girls Basketball Showcase. Uh, our mobile visitor center, we, we changed that up with a little bit more region, regionalization uh, based on our mobile analytics that I shared with you a couple of months ago, kind of pinpointing where our visitor comes from. We are also working with the artist community on the Yoko Cultural Trail, which is a trail throughout York County, focusing on the cultural aspects of the, of the communities. Now, one thing that we've done, we've continued to get 100% uh, municipal funding. Uh, we've increased our sponsor funding. Uh, we are regionalizing our marketing as well. And we've also continued to do the MLK Junior Holiday Basketball Showcase. Now, some of our top events this past year, uh, the SIAC Men's and Women's Basketball Championships, uh, the NAACP State Conference, the Carolina Top 50 Bass Series at, at, Lake, at Lake Wiley, the 74th AAA Revival Glidden Tour, which was a uh, historic car. We had over 100 historic cars that uh, ventured around York County uh, every day for an entire week. Uh, also the U.S. Disc Golf Championships. Now events that we partnered with or secured for this coming year, uh, we've got the NCAA College Basketball Academy. Uh, we've got worked with multiple esports events, uh, the South Carolina Dirt, Dirt Tour, uh, the College Regional Cross Country Championships, USA Track and Field Cross Country Regional, uh, the McDavid All American Camp, and we're partnering on six swimming events at multiple YMCAs across the county. Now, from a marketing perspective, we've really tightened our marketing down. We focus on uh, really five markets, Greenville, Asheville, Columbia, Raleigh, Durham, and Charlotte, because we know that over 75% of our visitors come from those markets. We're also focused on the destination. We do not market events. Uh, we focus on the destination and bringing that leisure traveler here. Uh, we switched to primarily digital marketing and we're integrating more video and using more influencers as we go through that. Now, how we market the destination, we do a lot of press trips where we bring writers in, uh, pitch different areas of York County. 
Uh, we've been highly successful with that. Uh, we do a little bit of print, a lot of digital, a lot of SEO, SEM, uh, a little bit of radio. We do a good bit of geo-targeting and we pitch a lot to TV. We've been on Wilson's World a good bit, QC3, Charlotte Today, all talking about different areas of your county. West has paid view. Now, when we talk about what we do, I think of what we do market is we market all of the outlying areas. We do very little in our municipalities, but we're marketing leisure travel to get people to come here to come to Lake Wiley, Brattonsville, Kings Mountain State Park, the Greenway, the Catawba River, Carowinds, um, to get them to come to the Catawba Indian Reservation, uh, the mural scavenger hunt, uh, hiking, camping, uh, Southtown Wake Park, a lot of different things. And I really wish you had this presentation. Uh, I did email it to you. Hopefully you're, you'll have a chance to look at it. Now, how we impact York County, uh, over the last three years, we've been involved in $72.7 .7 million in economic impact. That's just in the last three years. Now, looking at this coming budget, you all should have a copy of the 2021, the fiscal year 21 budget. Uh, our budget that we are proposing is 1,549,000. Now revenue, give you a few highlights of the revenue that's on there. Uh, we are anticipating $150,000 from Rock Hill uh, from their accommodations tax, uh, $74,820 from the town of Fort Mill with their accommodations tax. Uh, we do have 100% participation again from our municipalities. Uh, we're expecting 149,000 in grants, sponsorships and event revenue. Uh, we are planning to carry over $150,000 in savings from fiscal year 20 into fiscal year 21. And then we are budgeting $400,000 in our destination marketing fee program, which currently has 12 hotels participating in that. Now of that revenue, uh, with the current breakdown and my understanding from talking to administration, uh, the breakdown that I've got that I've been working off of is going to change uh, because of accommodations tax. But as it sits right now from first reading, um, York County is going to be responsible for 40% of our budget. Uh, the destination marketing fee will be responsible for 26%. Uh, Rock Hill, 10%. Um, money that we brought over from fiscal year 20 will also be 10% of our budget going forward. Now expenses for this coming year, uh, we have cut uh, expenses for salaries, training, travel, incentives, and recruitment. Uh, during the last two months, we've, um, we, we had to furlough two part-time people uh, we are, for, for this coming budget, we're putting more money into events and marketing. And the reason we're doing that is because our partners need us now more than they ever have. Our hotels need us, our restaurants need us, and our attractions need us. When you look at events and marketing, they make up 55% of our budget for fiscal year 21. That's compared to 53% last year, 54% the year before, and 54% in fiscal year, eight, fiscal year 18. Now, our funding from County Council has changed dramatically over the last two years. Uh, in fiscal year 19, we got $1.1 million from County Council. That was 75% of our budget. Last year, we got $862,500, which was 58% of our budget. This year, we're anticipating 40% of our budget coming from County Council with $612,500. Now, our challenge as the Convention and Visitors Bureau is last year, we faced a $300,000 cut to hospitality tax. This year, we're facing an additional 300,000 
in a hospitality tax cuts. So we went from $900,000 two years ago to an anticipated 300,000 this year. Now that's a 42% cut in our budget over the last two years. COVID-19 COVID has added to our challenge. Now, one good thing about our marketing in our budget for this year, we're a 95% drive market, which means 95% of our visitors drive into the market. Competition will be fierce with destinations attempting to reach travelers for leisure travel. They know that people are gonna get in their car and travel and every destination is going to be putting in a, an aggressive marketing campaign for that. Uh, we're in a prime location to capitalize on that trend. We must have funding to build a market the destination, especially during these times. Now, as you've seen in the budget, and I'm sure that you've probably heard, uh, there is a line item in our budget that is a partnership with Rock Hill Parks, Recreation and Tourism. And I'd like to walk through that with you just so you have all the information. We approached PRT with this idea last summer. And the reason we did was that we want to be connected with every tourism event that goes on in your county. And what happened last year was they had their Carolina Nationals BMX event and we were not involved with it. But what happened is we've done a great job with, with media branding ourselves and let them, letting them know what we do. Well, when this event came to Rock Hill, the media reached out to us to talk about that event. Well, we had to tell them that we couldn't really talk about the event because we weren't involved in it. So I reached out to PRT and said, look, we want to be involved with every major tourism event that, you, that, that you're bringing, and we wanna help however we can to bring that event to your county. And what this does is this prevents double dipping. And let me kind of explain to you how this works working with event organizers. When an event organizer comes into the community, they're looking for a place to go first. So in this instance, they go to the city of Rock Hill, they negotiate an agreement to get, to bring the event here. Sometimes that involves free facility rentals, sometimes it involves a bid fee, sometimes it involves a lot of different things. Well, then they were coming to us and basically asking for the same thing. So they were double dipping, getting funding from PRT and from us. So once we started talking about this, we decided that a partnership may be a good first step. So what this does with this partnership is the money goes to the event organizers to bring more events to Rock Hill PRT facilities. The partnership does not take away from anything that we do to promote other areas of your county. Without this agreement, if we decided that we were not going to do this agreement this year, we had budgeted $182,000 for 39 events in Rock Hill PRT facilities for fiscal year 21. With this agreement, we would budget 300,000 for 119 events in PRT facilities for fiscal year 21. We have also budgeted $217,500 for 28 events that would be held outside of PRT facilities in fiscal year 21. Now, where does that funding come from? That $300,000 comes from our destination marketing fee funding that is collected from Rock Hill Hotels to go to the Rock Hill PRT partnership to, to, to give you an idea on the funding breakdown of our hotels we budgeted four hundred thousand dollars from the dml for this fiscal year three hundred and forty thousand of that we are budgeting to come from hotels in the city of rock hill 
the other 60,000 will come from the three Fort Mill hotels, or excuse me, the two Fort Mill hotels that we have as a part of this part of this program. We do get $150,000 from the city of Rock Hill for accommodations tax. That has to go to marketing and operations of our organization. No funding allocated from county council be, will be used for this partnership. Now, to give you an idea, going back to something I said just a while ago, events and marketing make up 55% of our current budget. So including the 300,000 for the City of Rock Hill Partnership and the other funding that we're spending, we're gonna spend right at $517,000 in event expense. We're still, events and marketing are making up 55% of our budget compared to 53 last year and 54% the two years prior. So we're able to do this partnership and not increase our events and marketing budget any more than 1% over the last three years. Now, in summary, we've gained significant momentum since mid-March. Now, you may think, how does a how does a destination marketing organization gain momentum during a pandemic? Well, we've gained significant momentum since mid-March. We host bi-monthly webinars to help our partners weather this storm. We had approximately 40 partners on a webinar this past week with Watts Huckabee talking about the liability and insurance issues that these businesses are going to face coming out of this pandemic now that they're able to open. So we've taken the lead on that to put industry experts in front of our partners to ease their transition back into, back into a normal way of life. We also started a COVID-19 task force to help the hospitality industry with issues that they're facing. We meet with that task force every week and we talk about issues that they have and things that that we need to be working on and sharing with other partners. I, along with uh, one of your cohorts, Joel Hamilton, are one of the organizers in the York County Back to Business Initiative. Visit York County has been heavily involved in that from the very beginning. Now, since mid-March, so we're talking two months, we have featured York County and our partners in 33 articles, videos, and media appearances since mid-March. So we have been in the media promoting York County and our partners 33 times since mid-March. You have tasked this organization with promoting tourism in York County. We've also met the challenge of finding alternative funding. I, I stood before some of you in, in 2018 and, and you, you told me to you, your words were to prove yourself. I think we've done that. I think we've proven ourselves over and over with this organization. We need your support to continue to make York County a premier destination. This is something that we all need to do together and yes, we're facing uncertain times and, and we're, you know, I can use every other cliche that we've heard over the last two months. And the tourism industry has never faced anything like what we're facing now. But I can promise you, the tourism partners that we work with, they're ready to go. They need us. They need us to market them. They need us to promote them. They need us to bring people to York County to spend money. And that's what we're planning on. As far as events go, there will be events in York County this summer. <clears throat> there will be events in York County in the fall. Now, there may not be festivals or anything like that. We're not really involved in festivals because they're they focus on locals. We don't give any money to any festival in your county, but we do support them with other efforts, but there will be events coming. We're currently working on recruiting events 
for 22, 23, 24, and 25. So that is a, is a, um, a reality that we're focusing on the future. And I think we've 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 weathered the storm over the last few few months, and we're we're ready to uh, to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I'll be glad to answer whatever questions anyone has. Anybody have questions? I do. Go ahead, Joel. Billy, I appreciate your addressing us this evening and. Um, understand what a significant portion of our local economy depends on visitors into this area. Um, so certainly do not want to hamstring any efforts and support those business owners. Uh, I do have some questions regarding the uh, the Rock Hill partnership. It sounds as if perhaps um, the problem of the overlap and redundancies could be solved with increased communication rather than a line item. Have you all explored that option? Well, we, we wanted to bring more events. And in order to bring more events, this was uh, the best way to do it so we're not duplicating efforts. Because this, this money that we're giving is not going into the general fund of the city of Rock Hill. It's going directly to event organizers to help us bring more events to Rock Hill, and and you know, let's face it. From an event standpoint, the majority of the events that we do are going to be in Rock Hill and Fort Mill. We have a we have a few events in York, a few events in Clover, you know, a few fishing tournaments in Lake Wiley. But the majority of our events are going to be in Rock Hill and Fort Mill. And let's be honest, Rock Hill has all the facilities. We do a good bit with Winthrop. We got a great partnership with them, but this was all about bringing more business, bringing more business into the market. And with our hotel fee that we collect from the Rock Hill hotels, because let's remember this hotel fee we put together, um, we put it together to grow the market we put it together before Mr. Shanahan and Mr. Madden came to me to talk about uh, cutting our budget six hundred thousand uh, dollars. We we had already put that in place to grow the market, and the way we we were doing that is when we talked to these Rock Hill hotels. Remember, this is voluntary, so they have to sign the agreement with us to collect this two percent, and. When we do that, we tell them that money that comes out of the city of Rock Hill, a large percentage of it will go back into the city of Rock Hill. Same what we do the same conversation with Fort Mill. Uh, the money that we take out of Fort Mill hotels, we goes the majority of it goes right back into Fort Mill, uh, into Fort Mill events and Fort Mill marketing, and um, so. It was all about, this is a long way to answer your question, Joel, but it's, 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 all, it's all about more events to bring more business and more people into the market. You did mention that if that money is not given to Rock Hill, that that's money that would be spent to bringing events into Rock Hill regardless, right? Or did I yes. miss that? Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you just mentioned one of my questions was how do we track those funds and make sure they just don't disappear in the Rock Hill General Fund? How are you planning on tracking those funds into event growth in marketing in Rock Hill? Well, one th well, there's two ways. One is that this will be a collaborative effort. This will be us and PRT sitting down to decide how how that money will be spent what events we're going to bring in, then there will be a report that will be issued at the end of the year to say that money brought in these events and this is how much was spent on each event to bring them here. Because, you know, every event that we bring into York County costs money. 
whether it's a bid fee, whether it's a facility rental, you know, because every destination is trying to get these events and it costs money to bring them here. So there will be a complete accounting of where that money was spent and what events it brought. What would occur in the event of a shortfall? Because what were, you mentioned that the funds would come directly from the destination marketing fee. Um, however, basing our projections on what is, can at best be described as uncertain times. Uh -oh. Please. I think it's somewhat Sorry problematic. Sorry about that. that one. Siri, Siri just started talking to me. Sorry about that. I got you. Um, but what would occur in the event of a shortfall? Because the request is for a specific dollar amount and not a percentage of the destination marketing fee. So what occurs if if there's a shortfall in those funds? Uh, if there's a shortfall in those funds, uh, I mean, our our agreement with the city of Rock Hill is for three hundred thousand dollars. We would we would make cuts elsewhere because one thing that I do not want to cut is marketing or events this year specifically because we need as many events and as much marketing as we can possibly do. Thank you, Billy. I'm done. Hey, Billy, this is Bump Rider. How you hey. doing? Good, Bump. Hey. I appreciate you you trying to tackle this um, this line item with Rock Hill because I know it was um, it's it's been on every council member's mind and we've been scratching both ends trying to figure out how does this work. Um, my question is going back when you you talk about the hotel agreement and those funds that's coming in through that agreement, um, it's basically kind of going to be where you're pulling the money from to basically just give to Rock Hill, but does it Rock Hill collect a portion from the hotels themselves? Yes, they collect, they, well, they, they collect accommodations tax right. and then they have a host hotel program that, uh, they, I think they collect $300 from each hotel Okay, so on an annual basis. So why would we, and I know you stood before us and, and said this was a way that you could, and we all kind of agreed this was kind of a way um, to recoup some of what you've been cut or your budget been reduced by was developing these partnerships with hotels and now to hear that this money is going to come in to you and you basically serving as a pass through for the city of Rock Hill how is that really helping your budget when it's basically you're telling us you're just going to collect it and give it to Rock Hill and you know we, we've been trying to make sure you've been taken care of and we knew the hotel agreement would replace some of your funds, but now it just seems that you're just passing those hotels, that funding off. And I know you're saying it's a partnership, but once you turn it over to Rock Hill, Rock Hill controls that money and we want you to have that partnership. But I think if those funds remain in your chest and when you do sit down and agree as to how the money will be spent, which events you want to support, it then becomes your discretion as to what funds you release to events. But I think once you turn it over to Rock Hill, and they basically control it once it's in their coffers and I just don't see how that's a good fit for those funds um, but you, you mentioned how these Rock Hill was hosting events that you guys really weren't a part of and you got some calls and 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 you want to be a part of all the events all the major events you know if, if Rock Hill wants to have events and not have you as an ally not have you um, working with them, that's that should be totally their their right. But I don't think that we should um, be be strong armed into getting funds from them, then turn around basically doubling what they're giving us so that we can have that partnership. You know, it, it shouldn't work that way. And I don't want to throw any any numbers out, but it seems a little unreasonable um, um, to to have that kind of a arrangement. Um, it's just it's just concerning as to how this really benefits um, us supporting your budget. You're working for the entire county, but it and we know Rock Hill has all the facilities get the majority of the of the events. But it just doesn't look good with this the way this agreement has kind of been been uh, captured and, and thrown out because it obviously it was going to raise some red flags once once we kind of. Um, saw what was going on, but I just, I just, 
it's a it's a major issue right now as as um, we try to figure out how to best serve you for how to for you to best serve the county. And Joe asked a good question. If these funds don't come in, you've made a guarantee of those those funds. And if they don't come in, you're saying you're going to cut somewhere else. But at least make it a contingency that, you know, if a certain dollar amount don't come in from the hotels, you can't guarantee Rock Hill that because it's, I think you're, you're, you're hanging yourself out to drive it because we know things have been kind of uh, kind of short from this COVID-19 situation. But, you know, promising or guaranteeing that, that steep amount is, is kind of really going out on a limb. And I really don't see the benefit of putting yourself out there that much um, in a contingency situation because those funds are contingent on hotels getting booked up, not based off how many events come through. Yeah, I see, I see, I see your point, Bump. And, you know, we just felt like that with these events that we were able to do more by working with the city of Rock Hill to bring more events because we could have just taken that $300,000 and spent it to bring events in and not really accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. We want to bring the biggest events that bring the most people, that put the most people in our hotels. And we felt like it was best to do that in partnership with the city of Rock Hill because it's all about for us from a tourism perspective, it's all about bringing people into the market, getting them to stay in our hotels and eat in our restaurants and do all of the things that we, that we need them to do. And we felt like this was, this was the best way to do that because we're not just writing a check and not knowing where it goes to because we're going to work directly with the city of Rock Hill on every event that that this funding involves. And we already know that the, the 39 events that we were already partnering with, those are already in there. And we know that there will be a lot of others that we will be able to directly partner with uh, through that funding. And to us, it's, it's event expense. It's, it's giving money for facility rental, for bid fees, for whatever it takes to bring these events to your county, that that, that is the focus of this funding. Now, let me ask you Because we could, go ahead, I'm sorry. Now, now haven't, haven't these numbers been increasing year after year anyway? <laughs> you know, haven't, haven't they been on an upswing? You know, I can, I can see um, us agreeing to do things a little different if our numbers were going down in any category. But over the last several years, our numbers have gone up, whether it's um, accommodations tax, uh, uh, tourism dollars, events coming. You know, we're, we've been seeing a swing, an uh, upswing for the last several years. You know, so we're not in a down spiral where we, we have to try to recreate the wheel. I thought things were going going pretty well. And, and that's, that's the whole point of this. This point, this, this partnership is not, it's not a bailout. It's not a bailout to our organization. It's about growing this organization because our plan was to, was to, at this time, if, if, if we wouldn't have faced the cuts that we, that we faced, we would be about a $2.3 million organization right now versus a $1.5 million organization. And if we would have done that, the economic impact numbers that you would have seen would dwarf the ones that we do now. So we're having to be creative. We're having to be creative with everything that we do because of our funding. So we see this as the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to events and bringing bigger events and high profile events and larger events that will bring more people to your county. We see this as an avenue to do this. And, you know, that's, that's what our board uh, 
when when we discussed this and and there was some there was some questions about it there were some questions from our board um, but our board also passed it unanimously last week um, so it's for us we see it as a way to bring more business into the market by partnering with the city of rock hill I've got a couple questions. Um, I'm gonna give you credit for being creative, that's for sure. Um, so basically the city of Rock Hill in the past was giving you about $80,000 and now you're getting $150,000 but their return on investment is twice that because you, they're, they're giving you 150 but they're taking back 300,000. So um, a couple of things that you said were that um, the um, you're bringing business into the market as defined by you as Rock Hill and Fort Mill. That excludes York, Clover, Lake Wiley, Tiga Cay, and frankly, I believe it excludes most of Fort Mill. So um, the, because the largest percentage goes back to, goes back to Fort Mill. Um, you use the word you use county and city of Rock Hill interchangeably, and I don't I don't think those terms are interchangeable. I, I think I would have a hard time explaining to the people in um, Tiga Cay, York, and, and um, Clover, and, and especially even Lake Wiley, who brings in a big chunk of, of these hospitality dollars that you're asking for, um, how, why that money is being spent on bigger things to bring more people to Rock Hill. So, I mean, it, personally, I feel like maybe you should just, just partner with Rock Hill and let these other small towns keep their hospitality dollars and put them to good use in, in their own areas and just become the CBB for the city of Rock Hill. And y'all could create a partnership that would save tax dollars across the board in the, in, in the what I consider, county. Um, on your, in your uh, line item on your budget, under 5,000 earned revenues, you've got almost 15% um, in miscellaneous revenues. So that to me is 15% unaccounted for that I have no idea what that $150,000 is being spent on but it's, it's half of your biggest numbers in that column. So that's, that's a lot of something that's miscellaneous revenue. And I'm just, I don't know what that is. Um, but I mean, I, I'll just say that overall, I think it might be a great partnership with Rock Hill, but and I, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a good partnership for, for the county at all. Uh, let, me, let, let, let me answer a couple of Councilman Love's uh, concerns. Uh, one is the $150,000 in miscellaneous revenue. Uh, in my presentation, I said that that is a carryover of, of savings from this current fiscal year into next year. So that's money that we're carrying over. So that's why that number is so large, uh, because we've done a very good job of, of being good stewards of our money and saving money over the last couple of months, uh, because we knew we were going to have to weather this storm. Um, when I talked about Rock Hill and Fort Mill, I was just talking about events. I was just talking about facilities and events. Uh, we have events in Lake Wiley. We have events in York and Clover and Tiga Cay, but we do a ton of leisure travel marketing for all of those areas. That's where when you don't have facilities that you can host events, we focus on the leisure travel market. We do that in Lake Wiley. Um, Cause you know, you said that you could have a few less fishing tournaments. Uh, so we've got a couple of fishing tournaments uh, there this coming year. And, but we focus on leisure marketing for those areas. When it comes to events, Rock Hill and Fort Mill are gonna be, are gonna be the key ones because they have the facilities but we focus a lot of, of resources on leisure marketing, leisure travel marketing to those other areas. And inside the presentation that I sent you, you'll see a list of about 20 places uh, that we do leisure marketing for uh, to get people to come here to spend money, to get people to come to Brattonsville and Lake Wiley and uh, Ebenezer Park and McGill Store and all of those places that make up the fabric of what York County is, you know, that's what we're doing from a leisure travel uh, perspective. Um, but, you know, 
we we already had one hundred and eighty thousand dollars budgeted for events in Rock Hill PRT facilities. Uh, we felt like it was a good investment to put an additional one hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollars for an additional. You know, I don't remember how many exact exact events we were talking about, uh, but but we felt that was a good investment. And you know, this is not about Rock Hill versus York County or Rock Hill versus Fort Mill. This is about us trying to bring the most people into the market that we can who spend money and enjoy the things that York County has to offer. And we feel that this is the best way. This is one of the best ways. Now, this is not all we're doing. There's a ton of other things that we're doing along with this. You know, we're spending an additional 217,000 to put events in other places other than Rock Hill PRT facilities. So there's a, there's a lot going on, but we felt like, you know, we're tasked with bringing tourism to York County and the way we can do that to bring the most people for the least amount of money, that's what we're gonna to try to do. So what is, what is Rock Hill's net investment in the CVB? Their net in the city of Rock Hill? Yeah. They're, they're giving us $150,000 in accommodations tax funding. But then we are also getting, we, we budgeted $340,000 from Rock Hill Hotels through the Destination Marketing Fee Program. So what, so their net investment is what? $340,000 plus one hundred ninety thousand $490,000. And then, and that's not counting, and and that's not counting that some of that hundred and fifty thousand dollars that we're carrying over is probably probably came from Rock Hill Hotels as well. But let's say half a million dollars. So, how are we carrying over a hundred? Well, let me let me ask you this because I, I know with the projection of your budget being so tight this fiscal year with being cut, how are you able to carry over one hundred and fifty? thousand um in, in in spite of being cut so much and things being so tight where do where do we save well, 150 from well we cut all of our marketing since march 15th um we've saved money on marketing we've saved money on event expense uh from events that we were not able to host uh, we saved money from, you know, our utility bill was half of what it of what it normally is. Uh, so we've been we we've, we've been on a spending freeze for the last two months, uh, anticipating what we're facing now, which is a tight budget uh, with limited revenue, and that's the amount of money that we feel like we're going to be able to save to carry over uh, into next fiscal year. Billy, I've got one more question. I'll quit harassing you, but um, <laughs> this is the first I've heard of a York County back to business initiative. So um, obviously that's, that is, um, um, I, I don't know what, where would we have seen or heard of that? Well, it's, it's a partnership between York County, uh, City of Rock Hill, WRHI, uh, Williams and Fudge, Comporium, and the York County Regional Chamber of Commerce. And it is, um, it's a weekly one hour program. Uh, it's on WRHI, it's on Facebook Live, and it's on Comporium uh, that talks about um, this past week they had Ted Pitts uh, head of the South Carolina Chamber, who's also on Accelerate SC. Uh, he was on there, Tommy Pope was on there, uh, I was on there, the um, um, the owner of Knowledge Perk was on there. Um, the first week we had several local business owners uh, that, that was on there. Local, you mean local, um, you mean local business owners from Rock Hill? 
they were from all over. Uh, WRHI put it all put it all together. Uh, but Joel and I are on that committee. David Williams, um, several people. But it's it's and it's been wild. It's been greatly received uh, from the amount of traffic that we've been able to get um, of of just you know kind of getting people accustomed to getting back into the market, getting back into the restaurants. You know, if you go get your hair cut, what's it going to what's it going to be like? Do you have to wear a mask? Does the person cutting your hair has have to wear a mask? You know, all of those kind of questions that's going to ease the anxiety of people come to kind of getting back to normal. Uh, Billy. Yes. You know, I, I appreciate everything y'all have done because we certainly uh, realigned the revenue for CVB and uh, I think you've done a great job in making up for that and finding a great source of uh, future revenue stream. Um, help me a little bit here though. So like with Rock Hill events last year, how much did y'all allot for um, Rock Hill events? <laughs> Let me see if I can find that. Let's see. Well, this past year is kind of hard. To, it's kind of hard to gauge because we've lost uh, half of our events. Um, but last year, or in fiscal year 20, there was going to be 55, if, if we would have played everything, there would have been 55 events in Rock Hill for fiscal year 20. Or if 2019 is an easier way to go, I mean, either 2020 or 2019, whatever's easier for you. Uh, 2019, there were 39 events in Rock Hill. And how much money, uh, the the $300,000 situation, that's a whole new thing, correct? Just because of the partnership that you wanted to foster. Yes. So I'm just trying to, yes. I'm just trying to uh, get the numbers straight in my head about, uh, you know, what y'all spent like in 2019 and the return on investment and I'm just trying to grasp why, you know, to cut to the chase, why are you having to give them 300K back to work with them to foster things that you've done in the past? Well, it's not, and I, to, I don't have the answer to your question about the amount of money that we spent um, because we just got it, we've just got it into event expense um, and and to us, it's if we can the amount of money that we spend correlates directly to the number of events. So the more money we have, the more events we can bring in. And with this partnership, this is so let's take take the city of Rock Hill out of it. So let's say the 119 events that we're going to partner on. If we dealt with each event organizer individually and we paid those 119 event organizers $300,000 directly, it would be the same result as what we're doing now. Because what we're doing now is we're helping those 119 event organizers with funding that we would, that we could normally be giving them individually. But we decided to work with the city of Rock Hill so we're not duplicating efforts. So we're not 
so these event organizers are not double dipping because if the city of Rock Hill is giving free facility rental, we don't need to give an event $15,000 to cover their facility rental. But if we're not working with the city of Rock Hill, then we don't know that that happens. So we put this partnership together so we can work together just on events in the city of Rock Hill PRT facilities. If, if Fort Mill had similar facilities to Rock Hill and, and had events and we could put events in there just like what we're doing in Rock Hill, we would partner with Brown. Brown Simpson would be more than happy to partner with us. And Brown supports this because Brown's on our board. Brown supports this initiative with the city of Rock Hill because it's all about bringing more events and bringing more people into the market. And, you know, if we didn't, you know, if we didn't have to do the destination marketing fee program, this probably wouldn't even be an issue because we wouldn't have private money that we're collecting from these hotels that we're, that we're giving back to Rock Hill. So there's a lot of variables here, but from us at the end of the day, it's all about putting more people in the hotels, in the restaurants, in the attractions. And we feel like the partnership with Rock Hill multiplies our money and, and allows us to bring more people here, which helps everybody. Because when people come into Rock Hill, they're, you know, that's, that supports York County just as, you know, just the same as it does Rock Hill. Well, Billy, I, I appreciate what you do. I mean, depending on the person you talk to, tourism or ag is the number one industry in South Carolina. I've always thought it was extremely important. I'm just trying to get some of these numbers lined up in my head, you know, mainly the the new thing we're doing, uh, you know, with Rock Hill. So, uh, you know, I appreciate your effort and what you've done, and I'm going to leave it at that. I think Bump's talking, but I can't hear him. Yeah, I couldn't hear that question. Okay. I, my, is my mic on now? Can we, my my no, comment or question was, can we not have this partnership without stroking the $300,000 check and still uh, work with Rock Hill as to how much money each event is given out of your war chest or out of your spending budget versus saying we have to give them $300,000 to have a partnership because you're going to have to go to these meetings anyway or review any kind of application, but I just don't like the idea of giving them a $300,000 check and then having to um, um, still go through the rigmarole of sitting and working with the event organizers or making sure that they're um, not double dipping. There's going to be some involvement with Rock Hill anyway. Um, when you're going from 39 events from the previous year to 100 and I think you said 19, um, expect it coming up. So my question is, can we have this partnership without giving them a $300,000 check? Uh, it would, we would not have the, this, this type of sponsorship uh, because we, with, if you, if you watch Cornhole on Saturday at the Rock Hill Sports and Events Center and you saw how much Rock Hill was promoted there. With this, if this partnership would have been in place now, we visit your county would have been displayed as prominently as Rock Hill, city of Rock Hill was. And for us, that's important. It's important for our logo to be everywhere that someone comes to York County as a tourist, it's important for our logo to be there because we need them to know that they're in York County. We need to brand our organization that way. And that's part of the partnership. So every event that they have, we are a, we are a top level partner with them. And that's even events that we don't give funding for. 
that's for a softball tournament at Cherry Park that we don't give funding for. We will still be a partner in that event, which is important to us because it's people coming into York County and we need them to know that that York County is the is the DMO for for this area. So there's a lot of branding aspects to this as well that that goes into this partnership. And and I'll be glad to I'll be glad to send the send the agreement. I'll be glad to talk to any of you individually. Um, I, I feel like this is a, a terrible way for me to communicate this, but I know that that this is the way it is. Um, Billy, I'd like to see the. Oh, Billy, I would like to see the agreement between um, the CBB and the City of Rock Hill. Okay. I will send it to everybody. Billy, I'm honestly struggling with wrapping my brain around the, the rationale. If if part of the importance is the branding and the logo, does the manner in which visitors into the area for a specific event, the way that they spend their dollars while they're here, do the, does that change just because they're aware that York County was involved in the recruitment or the promotion of the event? No, it does not. Billy, this is Robert. I have a few questions if everybody else is taking a breath for a minute. Hey, hey Robert. Uh, before you begin, Robert, I do want to let everyone know I've been texting with Michael Kendry because of the way we call these meetings. At 7 o'clock, we will have to begin our special call meeting. We will then go back to the workshop as soon as the special call meeting is over. I, uh, I it's just just kind of the way this was all worded so robert it's all you for three whole minutes so <laughs> do what you got all right do. well billy i might just give you a list of questions and you might have to get back to me after the meeting or uh, i'll more, be more than happy to i would like to meet in person um and get some of this done or somehow however we need to do it get some questions answered um where are battle at the rock uh girls and boys basketball and the mok holiday showcase where are those held the, those are at the Rock Hill Sports and Events Center. Okay. Um, I have some some concerns. You know, I've been one of your biggest supporters along all of this and, and, and fought for um, your funding and everything as we go. But um, I have concerns with talking about, um, you know, if Rock Hill gives them free rent, then, you know, we're, we shouldn't be giving them money. I still I agree with Joel. I think we should be able to figure that out without cutting them a check or cutting the PRT a check out of that $400,000 that you figured out how to get and um, get together. You, you cut events according to your budget from 377,000 to 152,000, but then you added 300,000 back in with this line item. Plus the, the events I just asked you about are all in Rock Hill and they're listed separately. That's another $65,000 for those events plus the annual meeting which i assume will be in rock hill well this year i think it was going to be in, in, in uh, york. york actually yeah um if the theater gets to open back up so we'll take that out and say sixty thousand dollars there on those three events on top of the three hundred thousand that you're doing with prt already so i have a, a lot of questions that i'm going to need answered with that and and um, you know, you talked about that we're, we're marketing destinations, not events, but we've spent the last 45 minutes talking about events. And so I know we're getting ready to have to go, but that's the questions I'm going to need you to address with me at some point. Okay. Be glad to. Uh, very quickly, Jason and Richard, I apologize that we're about to bump you to later. Um, if you'll if you'll just text or call Mr. Hudson, he will let you all know when we are coming back out of the executive session, so that you can you don't just have to sit out here while we're doing this. We I don't believe the the special call meeting will take very long. Um, with that, we are going to end the we're going to suspend the budget workshop, and I'm going to go into the special call meeting. I'm calling a special call meeting of the York County Council to order.
Our first order of business is counsel to authorize the Office of Fire Safety to apply for and accept, if awarded, a grant from the Department of Homeland Security for the maximum amount of $100,000 with a 10% match from York County. Move to approve. Second. Second. There is a first and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Is there a motion to go into executive session? Yes, sir. Move to go into executive session for a contractual matter involving a spec building sale for receipt of legal advice in the contractual matter of blue granite water and for receipt of legal advice um, on Rock Hill Utilities. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? We are in executive session. Council has uh, exited executive session. Are there any motions? Yes, sir. Move to direct county manager and ED director, economic development director, to continue negotiations on the East Shore and spec building as discussed in executive session. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All the, second. All those in favor <laughs> say aye. 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 We are aye. adjourned. We are now back in our workshop. I don't know if there are any other questions for uh, Billy. If not, we can move on to uh, the uh, library board. The machine outside. We good? All right. Mr. Hyatt, your turn. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? We can. Yeah. Thank all you, right. Sir. I will keep my rem remarks short. And you all have received a copy of our budget request. I just have a, a few things to tell you. First of all, I'll start with the big point. Uh, for fiscal year 2021, York County Library is not requesting a millage increase. And as you can imagine, prior to the global health pandemic, things were chugging along nicely at the library. In fact, we were on track for a record year of use in multiple categories that we measure. Door count, program attendance, number of items borrowed, all of these measures were trending up. In the last year alone, we've added over 10,000 new card holders. And we're proud to have almost 65% of York County residents as card holders. That's one of the highest percentages in the state. Demand for our programs and services had never been higher than in the first part of 2020. The library's tagline and its goal is to be your community link. We think that's more important now than ever in the face of a changing public service landscape and evolving community needs. We've implemented new practices to expand access and availability of resources for our patrons. These include increases in the number of electronic materials and items available, as well as access to additional databases and learning platforms for all ages. In the coming weeks, we will begin curbside pickup at all five of our locations in order to get physical materials circulating again to our patrons. We've also started an e-card program, which allows anyone residing in York County to get a library account without leaving home. As of this evening, we've issued over 400 of those we're working with local school districts in order to offer e-cards to entire classrooms at a time. Uh, we think that will help address many needs for remote learners across the county. Back to our budget. We anticipate slight increases to expenses, including the state insurance reserve fund, telephone cost, our courier service that trans transports materials across the state as part of the SC Lens Consortium, materials processing, 
and the mandatory increase to the retirement contributions. Based on the given value of a mill, these increases can all be accommodated by our budget request without the need to ask for any type of millage increase or adjustment. The library remains committed to serving the people of York County no matter how our service model may evolve. We aim to connect people with the world of information and ideas regardless of the format or delivery method. Um, on behalf of the library and its employees, I just want to thank the County Council for your support of our organization. Our services have taken a big leap forward in the past few years thanks to that ongoing support. And we look forward with optimism as we approach the start of a new fiscal year. I appreciate your time this evening and your consideration of our budget request and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Anyone? Jason, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. This is Michael Johnson. Um, so you go to the library, it's fairly confined space, uh, children typically kind of reading area, you know, people walking along the bookshelves. How does, how does that change for you over the next year? What, how does, how do library, what do libraries in your opinion look like in two, three, four years? And how are we from a budgetary standpoint going to get you where you need to be? That's a great question and one that is generating a lot of discussion with library directors across the country. With social distancing guidelines, the traditional library service model does make it hard to try and operate as we have been in the past. So as we work on our phased reopening plan, it's going to include things like restricting the number of people that are in the facility at any one time, uh, breaking up communal seating areas, separating computers so that they can be at least six feet apart, to be honest with you, we will struggle with the amount of space we have in our facilities. Um, you know, we're, we're very fortunate and thankful for the funding we receive from the county. It's just a fact that we are behind some of our peer counties when it comes to square footage and library space. So I think there will be times when physical access to the build, buildings continues to be limited. I think we're also going to be delivering a lot of our programs and services remotely. We've already started a number of our programs on YouTube, Facebook. Um, we've had a good response to that. So I think at least for the time being, and definitely as we head into our annual summer learning program, we'll continue to offer those online. But it's going to be a challenge. Libraries are going to adapt and evolve in the, in the coming six months, in the coming three or four years. And I don't know what that will look like with the footprint that we have for our libraries right now. All right, thanks. Um, Jason, this is Robert. I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, one, uh, I recently learned about, and I don't know that I've ever heard, any, heard about it from anybody in the library, an app on the phone called Libby. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think we might need to do a better job of promoting that app because I had never heard about it until my administrator, one of my administrative assistants in the office said something about using it to read books and check out books. All right. It, yeah, it's, we've had a lot of positive feedback on that as well. Um, you've got over, let's see, at last count, I think we had over 750,000 digital items available through our various apps and services for folks to use without having to physically come into the library. And the second comment is um, I am a Georgia Tech alum and uh, took my grandson down there to try to talk him into going to college down there and play ball uh, last year and um, went into the school library for a moment and was really kind of shocked. It's been a number of years, as you can imagine, since I was at school down there. Um, there are no books in that library anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Everything is electronic. The students walk in and, and basically everything's on a computer they can read it online but there are no books in the main part of the library anymore it's completely opened up um do you see and i know that's an expenditure for terminals and all that kind of thing but do you see us moving to something more like that i don't think we'll ever i know that we won't ever get away from a library that has physical items uh, in the last fiscal year we circulated almost 1.2 million physical items not counting any of our electronic materials so there's still a, a huge demand for books uh, there's still a huge demand for people to come in put their hands on primary sources genealogical material local history uh, we are trying to match pace with other libraries across the state and in the region for what we expand in our electronic library our virtual library 
thankfully with the level of funding that we receive from the state library and the way we're able to select our materials we've been able to increase those offerings quite a bit so we'll continue to expand the virtual library add additional platforms for online resources and learning and add more content providers but um, I don't know that it would ever be in the best interest of the public we serve to not have books and physical items, especially for young children. That's one of the most important parts of learning to read is being able to get your hands on physical books and items. I'm glad to hear that. As, uh, I personally still buy books. I prefer to flip a page than, than swipe across the screen. So um, I just wondered because I was kind of shocked that Georgia Tech had gone to that extreme and had no books in the library anymore. Everything was electronic. So um, I'm glad to hear that. And I, uh, you know, I support it so much that I even have a little library outside my office, a little free library. So uh, oh, glad, glad to hear that. Well, thank you. Jason, this is Joel Hamilton. I have to uh, say I'm relieved to hear that there are no plans to abandon the uh, physical written material in the library. And I just want to thank you for your stewardship of an institution that I feel is very vital to the health and success of our community. So thank you. Well, thank you. We have, you know, we have great demand from the patrons of York County. I think one of the things that is a huge benefit to our patrons is that we participate in the SC Lens Consortium. So we have access to 20 different library systems, materials, not just York counties. We pay an annual membership fee of forty to $50,000 and some associated, um, associated membership fees with that. But in return, we get the benefit of borrowing materials with an average annual cost of about $2.8 million in items that we don't have to purchase but can still provide to our patrons. And those are all physical items that are coming from other locations. So we are, are proud of being able to do that, do it efficiently, and continue to get the things that our patrons need in their hands. <coughs> And Jason, I'm sorry, this is Robert. One thing I forgot to mention, a comment I wanted to make. I noticed the York Library has some um, wood rot and some stuff that needs some repairs and I had kind of hoped that it would get done while things were closed down, but I guess uh, that, that I know the COVID put a, a, a wrinkle into getting work done as well probably, but. Yes, we've, we've been trying to tackle some of the interior projects. Um, we're also working with Trey and county staff when it comes to some of the larger facility issues. So I'll make sure we follow up on that one. Thank you. Uh, Jason. Hey, uh, Britt Blackwell, I just want to thank you for the solid financial management you provided with the library system over the past couple, three years. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing in that regard. Thank you. It's definitely a team effort, and our finance manager, Lee Smith, was, uh, she's doing a huge, huge debt uh, for all the work and dedication she brings to the library. All right. Well, before we let you go, Jason, I do want to ask you this. Um, you know my personal uh, love for the bookmobile. Uh, kind of coming back from when I was a small child, that was the only library I was able to go to, literally the bookmobile coming to our circle uh, every so often. So what happens to the bookmobile over the next six months? Does it just sit? Is, is there a way to get it out and uh, out to children during the summer? Definitely. We're looking at a couple of different options for the bookmobile. One of those is in response to the request for more community Wi-Fi locations. So in addition to the library locations, our bookmobile can serve as a mobile hotspot. You can be able to park in different communities or neighborhoods and offer Wi-Fi access in the immediate area. We're also working on a plan with some of the senior centers and child care centers that we regularly visit to kind of provide the, the flip side of curbside pickup at the library. We'd be offering curbside drop up, so drop off so we can still get materials to those centers and those patients um, at the uh, senior centers, child care facilities, all the places they serve. So the bookmobile will definitely be rolling um, in the coming weeks as staff return to their duties. Very good. Well, unless there's anybody else, Jason, thank you for all you've done. Thank uh, you for talking. Michael, I hate to do this because I've already had a couple of them, but um, Jason brought up one thing that I wanted to make sure he knew. He talked about mobile Wi-Fi. The York School District has been doing that on some of their school buses. Um, so I would think it would be good for him to partner with them and see what they learned and what worked and what didn't work with their 
um, buses because they've been doing mobile hotspots throughout the York School Districts. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. And we, the library also lends mobile hotspot devices. So if somebody needs uh, high speed internet access, they can check out a hotspot for free in their, uh, with their library card from any of our five locations. So we're definitely interested in hearing what else works and trying to help keep people connected. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank all you, right. I appreciate it. Mr. Campbell, Richard Campbell, Executive Director of Cultural and Heritage Museum. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Well, I, I, I wanna thank you for the opportunity of being to here this evening. Um, but I do need to start off with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the CHM budget that you have before you has not been approved yet by the CHC by the commission due to the impact of COVID-19 on their meeting schedule. Uh, the budget has been reviewed by the finance committee. We will recommend it to the commission at its uh, May 26th meeting that the proposed budget will be accepted as presented at the finance committee meeting on May 11th. So I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that. Um, but if I could take a few minutes, I'd like to update you on some of the important projects we have going on at the museum this year is they'll have a positive impact on our budget and our organization for uh, many years to come. The mission of the Culture and Heritage Musici Museums is to communicate and preserve the natural and cultural histories of the Carolina Piedmont, inspiring a lifetime of learning. And that mission uh, is the guiding principle behind our strategic plan that um, these projects that we'll talk about, or at least the majority of these projects we'll talk about, um, are part of. Um, <clears throat> We'll start with the three, three major preservation projects at Historic Bratton. We have the Colonel Bratton Cabin Preservation Project, the Homestead uh, Preservation Project, and the Bratton Brickhouse Preservation Project. All three of these projects are funded through the CHC Capital Project Fund at the Foundation for the Carolinas, and the Brickhouse uh, Project receives additional funding from the Robert Hayward Morrison Foundation. At Brattonsville, we work to preserve the history of York County and to tell the story through the lens of the Brattonsville community. And it's the goal to restore and construct buildings that tell the story of the York County residents who fought for their liberties during the American Revolution and Reconstruction, while also interpreting the toil of their livelihoods. And all three of these projects are critical to that end. I'm happy to announce that the uh, preservation portion of the Brick House project will be completed by the second week of July. Uh, and we continue to move forward on the furnishing plan and the, with the design and production of interpretive materials. We look forward to opening the, the brick house to the public um, in the first part of the next fiscal year. I don't. I actually don't believe that the building has ever been interpreted before as part of uh, as part of the site, and probably had limited uh, public viewing uh, in its history. Um, so this would be very exciting for us. It allows us to expand the interpretive footprint and increase the capacity of the site to tell many important stories about uh, about York County during those time frames. Uh, the Homestead and the Brat Bratton Cabin projects are also moving in a positive direction. We're in the process of completing historic structures reports for both buildings. Those reports inform the architects and the contractors and the engineers on the materials and techniques that would have been used for e on each of the buildings and also what, uh, what each building would have looked like during their period of interpretive significance. So the portico on the Homestead, if you're familiar with that building, is an example of the need for this type of information. The current portico has to be replaced. It's in, 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 in poor shape. But we also know that that is a relatively recent addition to the building. The historic structures report will help inform the architects and the engineers as they design the appropriate replacement. Once this part is past us, the historic structures report is really the time alligator of the process. Um, the next steps are the completion of construction documents and sourcing contractors and, and contracts and beginning work. So that should all begin to proceed relatively quickly. Moving on to the uh, McKelvey Center and the window restoration project, a large portion of the funds for this project came from York County uh, HTAX and we've certainly appreciated that generous support. Uh, we are scheduled for completion on that project in late June. And it was a major project. They removed, repaired, and reinstalled all 146 windows, of course, the, the McKelvey Center. And there are 34 different types on that building, so there's no cookie cutter solution to that to that uh, project. 
not only uh, greatly improves the aesthetics of the building, but also when you combine it with the slate roof that was installed seven or eight years ago, it provides us with a sealed envelope uh, to better care for and preserve the collection and archival materials that we still store in the building. But equally as important, it allows us the opportunity to, re to reimagine how to better utilize the facility and to expand our services there beyond the scope of what's currently offered. And that to us is very exciting because there's an awful lot of uh, things that we can do at the McKelvey Center that will provide value to the community. At the Museum of York County, we are in the uh, stretch run of the new Pleistocene exhibit. And we're very excited about that. It's a state-of-the-art exhibit that will rival any exhibit in the state. It is absolutely a uh, fantastic project, and I, I can't wait for it to be unveiled to the, uh, to the community uh, early part of next year. Yeah, and the impact on the museum, once it's completed, can't be overstated. When you look at uh, the work that was done when we, um, when we, when we brought forward the uh, Naturalist Center, and it was pretty cutting edge at the time, um, and then it built onto that with the, um, the planetarium. It was the only half dome, fully digital planetarium in the region for such a long time, and has been a tremendous uh, benefit for us to allow us to tell the story of the skies above uh, the Carolina Piedmont has been very popular with visitors um, who, who have come and experienced that. Experienced that, excuse me. Uh, the project on this uh, project, which uh, which will be kind of the crowning piece of the of the museum, was slated to be completed in early June. But this is the one project that's been impacted by COVID-19 because we have a number of vendors that come from outside of uh, out of state. The Midwest, for example, where they're not allowed to travel uh, still. However, when that uh, we're at a point where when they are able to come back, things will progress very quickly. And this is another one of those projects that will be slated to open in the early part of the next fiscal year. While this, while the Children's Museum is not a project uh, that we've been working on that has had a very happy or a very uh, positive um, progress to, to date. I am pleased to say that uh, we are at a point now where the repair work and the reopening of the Children's Museum is finally set to begin. We're waiting on a couple documents from the contractor, uh, and as of this evening, they have those documents. They just need to um, send them to us, and once we have them, we'll be able to send a notice to proceed allowing the work to begin uh, on the Children's Museum. All of the exhibits are finished. That's all been taken care of, and they're being stored by the manufacturer and they're ready to be installed once the uh, work progresses to the point where, there, where it calls for that. And we think the, the repair project will take no longer than 180 days. I will say the impact of the site closing has been devastating on our membership and attendance. Uh, it is a, for such a small location, it is a tremendous driver, uh, economic driver for the museum, both from a, a membership standpoint, but also as, it, as members join uh, they work their way up as they age out of the Children's Museum and they, they, find, uh, they find a place at uh, the Museum of York County and so on. So having that being down for almost two years has had a, a very, a very uh, negative impact on, on our uh, institution. But we're excited about getting the museum up and running in the very near future. Uh, branding is another project that we've been working on. It's been a year-long process, and it's finally coming to completion. The branding project is really the glue that's going to tie all of these other projects once they come online together and give us the opportunity to communicate to different audiences uh, in a way that we think is going to really have a positive impact on the overall institution. The first group that it's going to help us um, impact will be to re-engage current long-term members visitors, I apologize, and former members who for whatever reason may visit less frequently or stop visiting altogether. The rebranding uh, will provide us with the opportunity uh, to effectively reach out and communicate that there's something fresh and exciting going on at the museums, at all of our sites, uh, and enticing them hopefully to give us another look. Of course, once they do come, the onus is on us to execute at a high level uh, so they want to keep coming back. But this is really going to help us reach out to those folks that have been long-term supporters and re-engage them and invite them back. And, um, and we, we feel that they'll be very excited about what they experience. The second level is to attract and communicate effectively to all the new folks that are relocating to York County, to communicate to them that they have a unique, vibrant family of museums right here 
offering a large variety of enriching experiences. Experiences tied to nature, to history, to imagination at the Children's Museum or heritage at the McKelvey Center campus. All of these things uh, communicating in a way that uh, cuts through the clutter using social media and an expanded uh, capability from that perspective to communicate in a way that people are, are becoming accustomed to communicating. Uh, we think that uh, that is going to have a, a big impact on attracting new folks to uh, our museums. And then lastly, because as the, our mission states, uh, that it, it relates to the Carolina Piedmont, just not York County, which is in the center of the Carolina Piedmont, we have the ability through our new branding system to cast a wider net. And that net will include people throughout the region because the Carolina Piedmont is not just York County. It is York County, but it's also Chester County. It's York Union County. It's Mecklenburg County. It's Iredell County, North Carolina. And for those folks, it's just as interesting and impactful to visit us as it would be for the citizens of York County. In 2019, we added a social media manager with the focus to focus our attention on expanding our social media presence and generate engagement ahead of the branding initiative because uh, social media is such an important part strategically to what we're going to be doing. And the magic, as is, is all of you know, is not to communicate to a separate and a specific individual who follows you, but to get those people to love what you do so much that they talk to their friends who are gonna to talk to their friends. And from that perspective, engagement, that engagement um, aspect, we've seen tremendous growth on all of our social media uh, pages across all of our platforms. And we have a, lot, we have a, a good number of, uh, of platforms, one for each site, one for the overarching organization, uh, even some for s special uh, areas of interest like historic preservation or um, the, the historic farm, for example, at Brattonsville. So adding that social media uh, manager to the mix really allows us to effectively generate high quality engagement that is gonna help us uh, spread the message uh, that we will uh, that we are uh, looking to communicate in a very cost effective uh, and a cost effective manner and the last thing that I'll just touch on as far as what we've been working on this year is a uh, focus on fundraising you know our this year we we uh, included a number of uh, events that were planned to be executed some were executed at the beginning part of the year to really get back into, with an emphasis on develop, expanding our development capacity. Um, unfortunately, the, the smaller events leading up to our large um, music festival, Holy Town Hall, that was planned for this May had to be canceled uh, due to COVID-19. But um, it has not been necessarily a focus of the museums uh, in the recent past, but it is a focus of the museums going forward. And we're excited about the opportunity to tell our story to people who would be interested in supporting us, sponsoring uh, programs that align with uh, their, their business models and so forth. We have, we have a great story, we have great services to offer, and we're excited about uh, looking at ways to um, invite people to be involved with us uh, on a go-forward basis. Turning to the budget, this year's budget, uh, certainly understand the challenges that have been caused by COVID-19. Like the library, we're a forward-facing organization. In fact, a majority of our staff members interact with the public on a daily basis, often in close quarters. Even these challenges are unpredictable, but we have to position ourselves to adapt and to thrive. Uh, in mid-March, we began what we referred to internally as a virtual museum project. To understand, you know, understanding, so when you're looking at the impact of the pandemic on school groups and will they be able to visit our sites or not, Will we be able to visit theirs, go to the schools and, and do traditional outreach? Probably not for the foreseeable future. So what does that mean? We have, so we are in the process currently of developing uh, high quality um, school, school, school programs to, to replace in many instances field trips and so forth on a site by site basis. The programs that we offer in Brattonsville are obviously different than the ones that we offer at the Museum of York County and so forth. But all these programs are designed to meet state standards and are appropriate for the for the grade and um, allow us to bring uh, to the schools to the classroom the same type of information uh, and experience hopefully that they would have received in many ways as they uh, as they would have come into our site. We also have to, as, as just as was mentioned. Um, 
as a pro as an issue facing the, uh, the libraries, I apologize, space utilization guidelines uh, spelled out by the CDC and DHEC relating to the numbers of people allowed in the facility at any given time based on square footage or percentage of occupancy. So we're looking at different ways to imagine how we would provide services across the board, programming, school programming, um, interactive opportunities for people. And so as part of this uh, virtual museum program, we've looked at a way to engage folks in a way that is meaningful based on four really, really real primary areas. Live content, produced content, um, expanded social media, which we touched on briefly, and then television. And that would be um, an area of opportunity for us that's been very good so far. The live content are basically symposiums, seminars, webinars, Q and A with our experts, where there's live give and take between presenters and the audience. Uh, we've, we've um, conducted two Q and A spots over the past two weeks, each attracting an audience of over 800 people uh, for the 45 minute event. So it's definitely generating the type of interest and engagement that we were hoping that it would. Uh, and as we expand, uh, we did one of our, we took one of our seminar series uh, events that was scheduled for the Museum of York County two weeks ago when we brought it to a virtual space and that uh, was well attended and the dialogue was very good. And again, we are, we are bringing this content to people when they can't uh, come to us uh, on, because of the situation. We're also focusing on produced content, which is high value production pieces that take virtual visitors on a, on a journey. So if you think about a virtual tour of historic homes of Brattonsville that have a 360 degree view. So you're standing in the parlor and you're looking around in a 360 degree environment and you see something that attracts your attention, an artifact, an exhibit, a piece of art. You can touch on it, click on it, and it will, it will open up and give you more information about um, that particular item of interest as you move through the entire tour. Some of these, some of these tours will be uh, narrated by museum professionals um, to provide additional um, content and impact. We'll also do uh, behind the scene tours of our collections, showing things that may not often make it uh, to, uh, to uh, display areas of our museums. Our nature programs on one of our many nature trails will be narrated uh, by our experts in the field. We'll even do sneak peeks at progress in the Children's Museum and the Ice Age, Ice Age exhibit. But these will be, um, you know, high, high production value pieces that we'll be able to utilize across a variety of, um, a variety of uh, platforms. Sheep sharing is an example of that. It's a popular event at uh, Brattonsville. We're going to, we're going to um, actually uh, record the event next week uh, in a manner that will be produced as a suitable segment to share, share with school groups, put on social media, or with other media partners like uh, WCC, BTV, and others. Uh, the third leg of the stool would be uh, social media as we continue to leverage uh, the various platforms that we have to expand conversations with the larger community and create awareness of our programs that we offer. Um, so not only continuing along the lines of the of the uh, the areas of social media that we've been very have been very beneficial to date, but also leveraging what we're doing in the virtual museum space to attract additional um, people and make them aware of what we offer uh, and show them that there is something for everybody at the museums. Uh, then our last would be television and expanded expand and replicate weekly segments on WCCB's Wilson World. They have a segment called Wilson's Homeschool, I believe um, Mr. Dunlap referred to that earlier tonight, um, where we have um, hist our historians, in fact, Zach the historian, as he's named, um, is on weekly with, uh, with Wilson's World. I believe he even has his own hashtag now with them. But uh, he, does, he does this day in history and uh, we also have our planetarium manager that does segments, our education program manager dealing with science and nature issues or opportunities, as well as um, folks out of Brattonsville talking about a number of things dealing with living history. So in thinking about what we're facing from a budget standpoint next year that everybody's facing, you know, I, I thought about uh, where I've been and how I became involved with the museums. I come from a business background. I, I ran um, a 
company for almost 20 years, always focusing on increasing shareholder value. And when you think about it, that statement's never been more important than it is right now. Our museums and our staff are committed to providing high quality services and programs to our community and thereby increasing our value to our shareholders, the citizens of York County. Our current budget is $3,636,100 and it represents an increase of $87,100 compared to the previous year's budget. And those increases are increases in normal operating costs. Um, this, the Culture and Heritage Museums are not requesting an increase in millage and we are so appreciative and grateful for the generous support we received from the county. I thank you for your time and I gladly answer any questions that you might have. Uh, Richard, hey, Britt Blackwell. I appreciate the uh, service that you offer York County. I think the museum's an important part of the quality of life that we have in the county. Just one quick question, the Children's Museum. So did I hear you say you're thinking it'll be ready to open back up in seven months? There we go, I'm sorry. I didn't, I, Dr. Blackwell, I couldn't hear you, I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I was just thanking you for the service you provide, York County. I think the uh, quality of life is enhanced by the museum system. Uh, but my question was, did you say that the Children's Museum will probably open back up in seven months? No, the pro the, no sir. Um, and I'm sorry if I um, inferred that. The actual repair project should take no longer than 80 days, 100, 180 days, I, I apologize. So we're hoping for that to be sooner. Uh, and through that process, we are, uh, we're hoping to open right after that. So October. Okay. So my, you're hoping before Thanksgiving? Okay, so much. Go ahead, I apologize. Did, did you say you're hoping to open before Thanksgiving? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thanks, Richard. Yes, sir. You need to unmute, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? Richard, thank you for pres presenting tonight. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Madden, it is now 847. What other issues do we have to follow up on? No other issues unless council has questions about anything in the budget. My only questions I had were on the fire budget and I sent an email to, to Andy, but um, I haven't seen a response on it yet. So I'll just look for that response. I have questions with the fire service as well. Um, and one question I'd, I think we did get a, um, an organizational chart of the proposed uh, where proposed folks are going. I, I asked one question about the volunteer uh, paper call issue. I'm continuing to get questions about that. I think we're way past time frame on that. Are we, can I get an answer on that via email within the next 24 hours so I can take a look at that? Yes, yes ma'am, we'll get you an answer on that. And I specifically like to know about PIBA and what PIBA's, uh, if PIBA gave some advice about whether or not we can make those payments without, um, I'd like to know what their advice was. I guess I'll put it that way. We can provide that. Thank you. I, I, I do want to add, um, you know, I know we're all burned out, so I wasn't going to go there, but uh, on the uh, firemen, situation I know we we've got a we've got to build a trust with the volunteer firemen they're the backbone of our county these many years so uh, uh, but I'm gonna hold off any discussion until the next meeting but I, I think one important thing we have to do is continue to nurture that trust for what they've done for us is, is Michael Kendry still on the line still available yes i am i wanted to ask a question because i think there's some folks that are listening in or at least they said they were are the is the next um 
meeting before council even though it was noticed as a zoom meeting since the council chambers are going to be open does that mean that folks who can um, and who would prefer that they can appear that way if there's a public hearing or to or, or is it going to be closed I am unaware of any is there a public hearing for May 18th I was unaware that there was one scheduled for that date is there whether there is or there isn't are folks allowed to come I guess that's my question are they prevented from coming that's a manager managerial question but if it's open and they can participate I'll, I'll defer to management on how they're monitoring the building the first I heard was the June 1st meeting we were going to convene at council chambers I had assumed the May 18 meeting would be just as there are other meetings which would be uh, not open to the public yet I think uh, our emergency declaration goes through the 18th and that was our expectation that we would not have the chambers open at that time however that that does expire in May and would uh, require council action to continue beyond the meeting on the 18th so I, I assume we would it um, probably discuss that some on the 18th and uh, unless council takes action we would resume normal meetings on June 1 Christy anything else I, I think it's I think it's wrong I mean we've got people who are who are having who are eating meals now we're opening things up everything's going to be basically opened on the 18th i think it's a problem to not allow citizens to show up at the meeting whether or not there's a, there's a public hearing and and i'm planning to be there we've got four council members who are there now and, and i just if somebody wants to show up and appear and speak for two minutes i think we need to resume operations so uh, and i think it's i'll address that uh, mr hutchman and i have met about a week or so ago and discussed uh kind of that procedure at that time the state had not opened back up so our plan was just to continue to do the meet, but to allow that ordinance to just expire and then we would begin normal meetings in june i i will talk with him tomorrow about a mechanism to make sure that council because i intend to be present on may the 18th as well um physically present in, in York. So I think what we need to do is we will have a plan in place, but I'll just, I'll talk that with him tomorrow so that we can, we can uh, do everything in our power to have that building open, although it may be limited due to social distancing, to have it open to people who are interested in being physically present for our needs. If I, if I could say, I think the emergency ordinance uh, <clears throat> requires that we we advertise the meeting as a virtual meeting however i don't think that prohibits us from opening the council chambers so if that's the it, it, we can talk I'll, i'm happy to talk with the chairman and don't see any real issue with opening it however i think the uh the two minute uh comment from the public was specifically uh, uh limited or omitted from that type of meeting if i'm not mistaken so we may be able to do everything and allow the chambers to be open, but I think we would still be under the uh, ordinance that was adopted previously by council. And we will, we will, David and I will talk with Michael Kendry tomorrow. We'll find a plan to, yeah, it, it may be limited, but we will, we'll, if we're there and people want to come, we will have a find a way to allow them to at least be physically present. Sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to, about the budget uh, from our previous workshop that you would like to address or have addressed? Look to adjourn. No, uh, Robert, do you have something? No, I'll just okay. like, unmute myself so I can speak with you and say, no, I don't have anything. I was going to say in the immortal words of Christy Cox, you're muted. Um, all right. <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. We are adjourned. Thank y'all for doing Thank this you. tonight.